So hey there friends and welcome to this episode of Self Kind with me Erica Webb. So this week I want to talk about the impact of rules driven thinking on self care. And I'm going to tie into this conversation some personal stories. A couple of different threads, um, but I mentioned over on Instagram what will be a couple of weeks ago by the time this goes live, that in high school I had the nickname The Fun Police, which really highlighted my way of seeing the world, which was very much this kind of good and bad, very, you know, black and white way of seeing the world. And I'm going to talk a bit about that. And my story is also going to touch on religious trauma and how that contributed to my rule driven thinking way of seeing the world. Now, I'm using that term religious trauma to tie this a little bit into last week's episode where you heard about this notion of religious trauma in my conversation with Sam Sellers, who joined me to talk about her experiences, both from a lived perspective and as a therapist working with others. And I've thought a lot about my conversation with Sam since then, and particularly my own experiences with religion as a child. Now, spoiler alert, I was born into a religious family, but left that world when I was in my late teens, early 20s. And so I've been reflecting on the impact that that has had on me from my childhood into my adulthood. And really, I'm going to share this story as a way of highlighting, I suppose, how our early belief systems and just any deeply held belief system can be impacting then how we relate to ourselves and the world and how that can impact our capacity to meet ourselves with kindness, compassion, and to actually be self-caring towards ourselves. So today I'm going to touch on three things in kind of a general sense. I'm going to talk about the impact that religion had on my my lifelong experiences of guilt and shame. And like I said, how any early beliefs can have a similar impact, whether religion is involved or not. More broadly, I'm going to talk about the impact that rule-driven thinking can have on our individual experiences of shame and what exists as an alternative to navigate that. And why it's so important for each of us to trust our own experiences and not like gaslight ourselves into thinking that it doesn't matter just because we can't accurately express the gravity of what we've experienced on the inside to the outside world. Okay. So I am going to be reading a little bit this, um, some notes from my screen. I'm not reading it word for word, but I do have some points for myself to keep me on track here. I don't usually do that in a podcast episode. I generally just have a a sort of dot point sense of where I'm going and I fill in all the spaces. Today, there's a little bit more detail in front of me. So if you're watching on YouTube, you might see that I'm looking down a bit. If you're listening, you might be like, it doesn't, you know, I can tell she's reading. That's fine. I am. So What I want to do today is give you a bit of a dot point version of some of these personal stories to give you a bit of a sense of the, you know, here to there to there. But we all know that life isn't clear and linear like that. And I'm aware looking back as an adult, I'm aware of my imperfect memory. I'm aware of the fact that memories change based on what we learn later on. So I don't plan to get into nitty gritty details as such, but rather to paint in kind of broad strokes to give you a sense of ultimately why I am so focused on this notion of self-kindness and compassion, why I'm so focused on self-care as a way of being rather than a thing that we just try to go through the motions of, because I think these parts of my story make that picture more whole. And, you know, I don't have a podcast so that I can just talk about myself. Um, I don't love talking about myself. I want to talk about things that I think are really supportive to other people. However, I think that might be one of these things. I think this, this story and my story might be something that will help some of you listening. And so that's the spirit in which I am sharing. So I was born into and grew up in a Christian family. I knew nothing other than that life, right? Whenever you're born into something, that is all that you know. We went to church every Sunday and my parents were pretty deeply involved in that world. 
On reflection, I realized that I never felt deeply connected with it myself. As a kid, and honestly, as an adult as well, I've never really felt like I fit in anywhere. I never really found the right shape for my puzzle piece beyond kind of my immediate friendships and family. So I didn't find that inside the church and I didn't as a child and a teenager and a young adult find that outside of it either. But within the context of church and religion, nothing happened to me, right? I was not abused. I was not physically harmed or made to feel unsafe, but something happened in me that had huge repercussions later in my life. And if we want to use the terminology of religious trauma, which, you know, I'm, I'm using not, I'm not using it lightly. Um, and I'm a little bit reluctant to, to, to term it that, but the trauma element of that for want of a better description for me, that looked like not trusting myself. And it looked like having a deep sense of fear, anxiety, guilt, and shame, shame that seemed to like permeate my very being. It seemed to ooze out of my pores. And that led to lots of difficulties, difficulties with intimacy, with feeling ashamed of what was going on in my inner world, in my mind, fearful of the outer world and scared always of doing the wrong thing. Here's the thing, though. I left the church and sort of dropped out of religion, opted out of that belief system before I hit 21 years old. And yet those impacts followed me for a really long time. And in fact, I would say that to some extent, there are still traces of them there now. And I'm 41. So here's the funny thing. I've written out notes on this episode so many times. I've put in anecdotes and then I've taken them out. I've put in stories that seem to highlight points and then I've removed them. I've moved things around a million times. And as I said, I never write out my podcast episodes like this. And yet I've really struggled to put into words what it is that I want to share. And it reminds me of all the conversations that I've had over the years. And I've had a lot where I've tried to describe the scars that were left in me. And my descriptions always seem to fall very short of my inner experience, which led me to question a lot, like, is it me? Am I the problem? Am I just too sensitive, too fragile, too something, right? Am I just dwelling on something that I should be able to let go of, that I should be able to get over? Was it really that bad? And here's where I want to pause to make a point that is relevant beyond my story and beyond the immediate topic that we're speaking about. And that is to say, don't gaslight yourself into dismissing your inner experience, because that's actually a very easy thing to do. We feel something on the inside that has like a shape and a weight and a gravity and a texture to it. And then we try to describe it on the outside and it emerges kind of flat and small and shapeless. And we're like, this isn't what was on the inside. And so it feels like an inability to translate that inner experience into something that makes sense to other people. But that inability to do that does not invalidate your experience. It doesn't mean that it isn't the weighty gravity driven kind of thing that has lived inside of you. It's just hard to share, hard to explain and hard to um, paint into a, a picture for people to understand. And so I think that this is why it's easy to feel misunderstood and to feel unheard in our struggles. Because when we say out loud what has otherwise lived in a dark private space inside of us, it's simultaneously like vulnerable and somehow seems to fall short of the gravity of that vulnerability for us. It's a really interesting kind of situation, right? So back to back to my scars. I think a big part of the persistent anxiety and guilt and shame that I felt was because I felt like I was always being watched. If God was this all-seeing, all-knowing being, then nothing that I did or thought was private. And there were rules, lots of rules, (laughs) so many rules. Do this, good. Do that, bad. But more than that, I had this 
really deep belief and understanding that it was more that do this, you're good, do this, you're bad. And that is where shame lives. And my overall sense was that there was a lot to fear. God was fearful and so was the devil. And so was I, right? Because I had darkness in me. And that was to be feared as well, because what if it was the devil getting a foothold, right? What if I was going to be judged by God? So I learned to people, please. I learned to just simply be a good girl. I knew how not to rock the boat. I knew how to get the boat to settle if it inevitably wobbled. I knew how to be good. I knew how to placate. I knew how to be good, like really, really good. But even though I was a good little girl, as I entered into my teen years, I was kind of quietly aware of this sense inside myself of like, I don't think this is where I belong. I don't know if I am bought in to this. And I can remember, I guess I would have been maybe 16 years old as a get at a guess. And I can remember seeing my peers all excitedly kind of like lining up to be baptized uh, because in the church that I grew up in, you did that as you got older, it wasn't, you didn't do it when you were a baby, you did it when you could choose. And I remember them lined up in their white clothes, waiting to be submerged into this holy water at the front of the congregation at the church. And I watched from the audience, right? I wasn't lined up with them. And I wondered like, why do I not want to do this? Why do I feel kind of weird about this? Why, when they seem so uh, compelled and driven to that, do I feel like I want to withdraw and hide. And I kind of just felt like I didn't belong there. Right. But then when I'd go to school where the people were very different, mostly to the people that I spent time with in the church, I felt really lost there too, because I was this sheltered girl who really didn't know the ways of the world. And high school was a a rude shock to a lot of my uh, sensibilities. And so Looping back around to the intro where I said my my fun, my my fun, and that's not what I meant to say. My nickname in high school became the fun police because I was an absolute stickler for the rules and you better believe I was ready to put a stop to anything that broke the rules because I was scared of that, right? And so that fun police persona kept me out of a lot of trouble that I saw, you know, my peers and my friends fall into. But the sense of safety that it afforded me um, came with like a sense that it wasn't a real safety, right? So like, follow the rules, you'll be fine. Follow the rules, you'll be safe. But it was not real safety. It was like a pseudo safety, a safety that came from quelling the persistent shame and guilt rather than as a true desire to be like, this matters to me. This is an important you know, rule to follow or an important thing to, to do. It was all about not feeling bad about myself because I'd done the wrong thing. I want to come back to this idea of rules, creating a pseudo sense of safety and certainty in a second, because this relates to the bigger picture of how do we navigate self care for ourselves. But first, I want to tell you the story of um, breaking up with religion so we can kind of get to the end of that story before we move on. So I left the church and I left religion in my very early 20s. It was like maybe late teens, early 20s. Now, I guess it was early 20s. I got married very young. I was 21 years old when I got married, Um, a decision that also stemmed from a lot of my um, upbringing in the church. It ended really well, though. We're still married 20 years on. Um, But I left and I didn't find that a very hard decision, to be honest. It wasn't it, it, it became apparent to me that I'd never chosen that belief system. Right. I was born into it. I didn't choose it. It was all that I'd ever known. But I hadn't consciously made the decision of this is what I believe. I just hadn't really ever been presented with another option. And so Whilst it was all I knew, I also knew it kind of wasn't mine. And so I simply stopped going and I stopped believing. And it was genuinely as as kind of simple as that in some ways. But the marks that that belief system left on me did not depart so quickly. And nor did the guilt 
of feeling like I disappointed my parents. That hung around for a really long time. Now, I've told the story before on this podcast and in other places that it was after I had my kids that the guilt and shame like really showed up in force and I ended up in a very dark place. And that was really when I fell into this pit of of self-hatred. I did not like who I was. I did not feel good about myself in any way, shape or form. And I think it's drawing a very long bow to suggest that it was the scars of religious beliefs that like led me there and like it was the only influence. That is that is untrue. But it definitely had an impact along with other kind of patriarchal patriarchal belief systems that we're all in, right? That we all live under. This notion of what mothers should be like and I put so much pressure on myself and those belief systems also very much rested on notions of power and control and hierarchy. And I turned those systems on myself. Now I didn't have the language for this back then. I didn't have the insight right back then. So I never would have described it like this, but on reflection, that's what I can see. I was kind of suffocating myself under these same systems of power and control. So this is where I want to segue into talking about the pseudo safety of rules that I alluded to earlier. In high school, when I was the fun police, now like a little side note, probably there's plenty of people in my life that would maybe still call me the fun police. Um, I'm still, I still like rules, um, but I'm much more flexible than I used to be. And I'm much more interested in my inner guide posts, right? Rather than external. Um, but anyway, just thought I'd say that in case anyone's listening, who knows me really well. And they're like, "Mm, (laughs) there's still traces of that. Fair, very fair. Um, but in high school, following the rules gave me a sense of safety and control by following the rules. I could avoid risk, right? I could come to believe that I was good. I could avoid being bad. It was sort of easy, right? But here's where shame shows up again, because when we start to look at things through this very simplistic lens of this is good and this is bad and good means I'm good, bad means I'm bad, then the line between them is very sharp and clear and solid. It's like when you're driving down the road and you know there's a line that is painted on the road that says you're not allowed to cross lanes here, right? Go over the line, that's bad. You're driving on the wrong side of the road. But the problem is that life is kind of more like the dotted line, right? Where it's not always so clear what the right side of the line is to be on. And what happens is when we're living in that kind of good, good, bad dichotomy, we feel okay about ourselves when we're on the right side of that, right? When we're on the good side, we feel okay about ourselves. But when we step over that line or when the line turns out not to be so solid, and we're not really sure which side of the line we should be on, that's when shame saunters in. And it doesn't just come in quietly. It comes in wearing its bells and whistles and its flashiest outfit so that we know (laughs) we don't miss it for a second. Hello, I'm here to ruin the day. And shame comes in yelling, you thought you could be good, but it turns out that you're bad, right? And everybody saw, and they all know you're bad now too. And that does not feel good at all. Ouch. And yet I think that this is how a lot of us look at things when it comes to self-care, which is where I want to go next. This is huge. We say, here are all the good things that I should be doing. And here are all the bad things that I shouldn't do. And we might not have actual lists, although sometimes we might. I mean, I've made those lists in the past where we're like, here's the good habits that I want to be engaged in. Here's the bad ones that I'm going to stop. And we essentially are saying, well, if you can do the good things, you're good. If you do the bad things, you're bad. And that's where we get ourselves in trouble when we mix up this notion of if you do this, you are good. And if you do this or don't do that, you are bad. That is the recipe for swimming in shame. Shame is normal. You know, it's not about avoiding shame, but we are (laughs) creating a shame inevitability when we live like that because we are 
human. And when we live in that good, bad dichotomy, it leaves absolutely no room for that. It doesn't leave room for being human. So it gives you no wiggle room. Plus it gives you zero strategies to deal with the shame when it actually shows up because it will, because you're human and not a robot. So in those early days of motherhood or years, <laughs> early days, early years, um, it was when I treated myself in the same way that those systems did with clear demar- demarcations, right? Between what made me good and what made me bad that I like really ended up in a bad place. And maybe I would have ended up there regardless of my past, right? Maybe I would have ended up there regardless of any religious history or anything. But I also can't help but see the parallels between having seen things so clearly through that lens for such a long time and then turning that on myself. Now, the way out of that for me And honestly, it feels like it's a continuous process. I don't know that it was like one day I just went, oh, I'm out. (laughs) I think it's an ongoing thing. Um, But it's been a combination of self-compassion and kindness, as well as questioning this notion of there being a good, bad dichotomy. This is where I love acceptance and commitment therapy. So as a counselor, I use this um, form of therapy with a lot of my clients Um, We weave it into a lot of other stuff. I'm not a purist by any stretch, Um, but I love this because in acceptance and commitment therapy, we talk about the difference between rules and values. And the thing is that living with rules says, here's the line between good and bad. And my mission, my mission as a human is to simply stay on the right side of good, (laughs) right? To stay on that side. And it's problematic because if we take self-care as an example, It's never going to be so that you will have like 100% perfect compliance with all the rules that you put in place for yourself. A robot might have 100% compliance, but you won't because you're human. And so as humans, we stumble, we change our minds, we have access to resources that ebb and flow, both internally and externally. So we have to find something that's more flexible than rules. Rules don't serve us especially when it comes to things like, how am I going to care for myself? Because you can see that if the rules are in charge, then every time we step outside the rules, suddenly we're bad. And I don't think that's self-caring. I don't think that's kind. I don't think that that's the kind of foundation that we build a relationship with ourselves that is loving from. It doesn't really work. So when we replace this with flexibility and values, That's when we get to say, well, what actually matters to me? If my inherent worth is unaffected by my choice to go to that yoga class or not go to that yoga class or eat that donut or not eat that donut, what have I got to navigate that goes beyond a simple dichotomy that says this is good and this is bad? And the thing that differentiates this or the the alternative, I guess, is a better way to say that is values, knowing what actually matters to you, not because you're scared, not because you're trying to avoid guilt, but like what actually matters to you. Values are flexible and they cut through the, the solid notions of good versus bad. And so that's what I ultimately try to do now. And it's the work that I do with my clients. And I still notice rules come up sometimes for me. Absolutely. Again, I'm human. I'm not looking for perfection here. And not surprisingly, a lot of the women that I work with are often caught up in similar challenges, stuck in loops of like self-criticism and self-judgment and not enoughness that keep them at odds with themselves and with their body because of that lack of flexibility, because of that attachment to I did this, so I'm not good. I did this and so I'm bad. And when we can extract ourselves from that, that's where the, the, the possibility, I think, exists for us to meet ourselves with more softness, to be able to create a foundation that is loving in our relationship with ourselves and with self-care and with our body. All right. So as I wrap up this episode, I feel like I just like phew, words, so many words. But as I wrap it up, I I want to, I guess, offer up a couple of um, questions for reflection. 
I wonder how you would see systems of power and control influencing you over your lifetime. They might not be religious in in their um, context all, at all. Or perhaps you do follow a religion and you're like, that hasn't had that impact on me. What other systems of power and control have influenced you? It could be things like the beliefs that women should look a certain way or hold particular kinds of roles in society and families. It could be what has happened in your workplace um, and how systems have affected you there and and how they've affected your notion of self-worth. And how have you turned those same notions of good and bad and rule-based thinking into how you relate to yourself, how you relate to self-care and how you approach this notion of being self-caring towards yourself. And finally, where do you want to explore the flexibility of values and self-compassion as antidotes to the shame that the good-bad dichotomy brings up? And I do want to say too here that if this episode's brought up some stuff, which, you know, it's possible, um, you can inquire about working with me one-on-one. This is the kind of work that I, I do with um, people inside my, my counseling practice. Um, or reach out to me if you would also like to be referred on to somebody else. So I've got, you know, other people that I can refer you on to as well. Um, but please do know that if you are experiencing something and you're like, wow, I'm so deeply wound up in shame and I really don't like my inner experience of myself, um, that's a really tough place to be and you're not alone and you can, you know, reach out for support. That is exactly what, you know, we're here for. I say we, the royal we, of course, I'm talking about that's what I'm here for if you would like support from me, but, you know, the greater kind of um, network of, of counselors and therapists and, and body workers, like that's what we're here to hold and to support you with. So please don't, res- don't, please don't hesitate to reach out if that is something that you need. You can connect with me via my website, send me a DM over on Instagram. If you're on YouTube, you can, you know, leave your comments if you've got um, something that you'd like to share. Thank you for listening. I always feel a little hesitant to share pieces of my own story because I don't um, want to sound like this is all about me because it's not. But I do hope that it's relevant and that it helped you to um, find some tenderness for those parts that are inside of you as well. So until next time, keep being kind to yourself. I'll talk with you soon.